Hey, hello, this is Sean from the podcast Thrive Not Survive After uh, Child Abuse. Um, Yeah, we are already on episode 54. Uh, Yesterday we talked uh, a little bit about uh, breaking bad habits and making making some good ones, you know. Uh, If you haven't listened to it, uh, I made a strong case to to say it takes you at least like 60 60 days of doing it 60 times consecutively before you can uh, say that uh, actually you internalized a new good habit or you broke a bad habit, right? You know, like um, quitting smoking or taking on some good uh, ex- uh, some good habits like doing an exercise. Today we're going to talk about an entirely different topic and that is actually um, a pretty serious one. And that is, what is the behavior of a child abuser? What's the behavior of a child abuser to get access uh, to uh, to your child or the child that is in your care. Um, I was uh, just um, last week, I um, I did with someone uh, an online course um, and she was, uh, she was volunteering uh, to do some work with younger people and, and she was, uh, it was mandatory to do a course in how to recognize actually behavior of, uh, of child abusers and um, Obviously, I was very interested in in how that was, and uh, it was it was a good course. It was a little bit legalistic in my in my opinion, but that didn't that that doesn't matter so much. It was a really really good course. But it was specifically focused on areas um, where people actually um, you know bring kids together, like a summer camp or uh, you know boy boy scouts or girl scouts, those kind of of things, right? Um, because you have to think about it like this, this was the, this was actually the case that was made that a, a child abuser obviously is going to put himself or herself uh, uh, in a situation where they have access uh, to uh, to the to the children of their preference, boys or girls or boys and girls, and often uh, a very specific age group. Now, uh, like I said, it's not a a very nice topic to talk about, but we have to uh, make these things that we're talking about uh, very real as well. So normally I talk about victims and I help victims to go from a surviving life to a thriving life. But uh, one of the big goals that uh, I have with my nonprofit organization, a dancer's movement to stop sexual abuse, is literally also to prevent the abuse. And that is not an easy task. Because first of all, most cases uh, get, um, get unreported, but scary enough, even if they get reported, that's always after the fact, right? It's after the fact. So hence, uh, I focus a lot on helping people, you know, to uh, to get empowered and get back into life again. But if we don't make a really strong effort in stopping the abuse, then this becomes just an ongoing thing, right? And, uh, and the couple that was presenting it uh, made actually four really good points. And uh, you can use them in youth organization or where you bring uh, younger people together. Uh, and to recognize uh, the behavior of a child abuser, but this can also be uh, done in a domestic in a domestic situation. Because think about this, right? Um, most abuse cases are done, you know, over over eighty percent are done by a person that is already very close uh, to the child. So even though the effort uh, for the course that I was following was really good for uh, for youth organization and things like that still most of the abuse happen uh, happen they happen at home family members close close friends and stu- so stuff like that so in the beginning i was a little bit thinking oh is this really helpful it's always helpful by the way right even if that's not the biggest group it still needs to be uh, it still needs to be done but i thought the four points the four main points that were made actually were very useful for parents as well. So I hope parents are listening and that we connect in some sort of a way so we can go deeper in those four points. But let me introduce uh, them to you. First of all, the effort that uh, a, a child abuser is doing is to get access to the child. So 
but that's obviously right so uh, often you see that with some family members they might not have a lot of interest in a certain couple but when they start to have younger children suddenly they show up more uh, portray themselves as a, a sugar uncle or a sugar daddy or whatever that is and and that doesn't mean that that a family member that is nice is immediately an, a child abuser but it should at least give you and unfortunately we have to live uh, like that in these days it should it could give you a little bit of a warning right and this was interesting right uh, a child abuser is of course it's grooming it's trying to get his it's trying to get access to the child so it's going to be it's trying to make a bond and a connection with a younger child but most of the time it also tries to make a good connection with the parents of the child so in in the case of the organization it was it tries to groom maybe the, with the organization itself and then later on with the child but if you put this in a domestic situation then you could say that this person is trying to become good friends uh, with the family the older family members uh, often the parents maybe the older siblings so that at some point in time they can be alone with each other. That's the that's the end goal that that person wants. So the grooming happens on two levels. So it's doing the it's doing uh, the parents or the caretakers, and it also starts to try to become a really good friend and a trustworthy person of the younger child. And it, it depends on what the preference is. It's, it's a little bit weird to talk about these things, but but the child abuse often have a preference for either a boy or a girl um, and a certain age group. So uh, what is, does grooming mean? It means, you know, bringing gifts. It could be just being very friendly, always uh, help, uh, giving a helping hand, uh, just becoming a real good friend of, uh, of, of the house. And it sounds awful dirty, but if you think about the numbers, like I said, over 80% of the child abuse victims are done by someone that is very close most of the time even a family member or a very close friend of the family and you don't become a friend just from one day to the other so it, it, it as bad as it may sound um, an abuser often has a very long strategic plan he's grooming and grooming until until he can take another action um, and the other action is after you give all the trust to this family member or friend uh, and and the child is left alone with that and soften like to babysit or just to you know play in a park or play somewhere else in my case it was literally playing upstairs uh, no one was actually paying attention how uh, where my uncle and me were and we were just first downstairs and when the house was alone he took his chance that was the first time and he took me upstairs to say to do a pillow flight, a fight. I, I still can remember that, and I loved pillow fighting. So I was an easy target. He probably knew that I loved that. You know, he knew. He probably tried out and what kind of games the show like. So that that's how he did it, right? And then uh, bit by bit, in my case, it didn't go so slowly to be honest. But bit by bit, they start to um, they start to introduce. Uh, a different type of games often games that have something to do with nudity and touch right now very often a child at that moment in that early stage tries to talk uh, to someone else already right it, it seriously does and but it's often in, in in my case I can testify to that but I've also heard of course many abuse victims in this case we often as abuse victims try to talk to parents only once because we have a very strong feeling that we did something wrong so we have to overcome something to tell to the parents hey what's going on and very often parents don't listen or they don't pick up on the signals here and uh, and as I always say you know you better listen to your child to your child the first time that they tell you because it also might be the last time you know so um, and it's a it's a very it's a very sad situation in my close family where that happened is with the first uh, person that that happened with was one of my siblings tried to talk to my dad my dad didn't want to believe him and actually he uh, he got punished uh, for that and uh, and actually did it, it broke the trust between uh, him and my dad uh, for a very long time 
but strangely enough uh, my dad didn't pursue the story so there was an opportunity actually to overcome all the abuse that happened afterwards it was a very ugly story and the story doesn't tell on its own but it's the same thing it followed the same pattern right you know gaining access first to the family become a good family member then trying to gain access to the younger children of his or her preference and then starts to um, start to introduce other things what we call barrier testing you know see how far the child is willing to go without going to the parents uh, and so on and so on and then the last step and it's not I mean it doesn't go it goes hand in hand right the last step that the uh, abuser always does is try to build some sort of a bond of secrecy and it could be sometimes like hey we have a secret it could be also go together with threatening it could go together with bribing and and what have you not and uh, my abuser and abuser of uh, of my siblings was very successful in that because it took us uh, 19 years before we start to tell this story um, beyond ourselves. And that is strangely enough, that number is the average of any child abuser that is, if they tell at all, um, is when they come out um, with their stories of what happened to them. And there's a lot of shame and there's a lot of feeling of guilt in there, right? You believe it or not, but um, an abuse victim often thinks that it is their fault, which is of course not. And we often think that we are the only one for some reason, right? We, who would have known that, uh, that my uncle would do the same thing in the same period of time to to other siblings of me. And like I said, my story doesn't uh, stand on its own. Uh, in my book, Broken Silence, I, I talk a lot about how to go from um, living a life uh, that is more about surviving to a thriving life. How do you tell your story and what have you not? Um, you know, if I do a rewrite of my book, and maybe I do, or I make, you know, just an, an extra edition of it, I probably would add these steps to it. You know, so I, I, re I repeat them to you and I probably will bring it back in other podcasts and go a little bit deeper in it. But these are the signals as parents that you can pick up on. I wrote a little bit about it in my book, but the purpose was slightly different. So I thought it was a really good addition. First of all, the child abuser, you know, is trying to gain access to the person, child often, um, of his or her preference right uh, then they start to groom the family they start to groom the uh, the parents the caretakers and of course also um, the target so to speak uh, and then thirdly he starts to when that is successful then he tries to get the child alone and when he has the child alone or she they start to introduce other type of games often uh, that have to do with nudity and touch and we call that barrier testing they test how far the kids wants to go uh, with this person and it could be first just playing with your clothes on and bit by bit you know the clothes goes off it could be watching pornography together it could be all these kind of things it could be stories um, and and that he tells or she tells uh, with uh, of sexual nature all these kind of things and then last but not least uh, they immediately start to invoke uh, tactics to keep the child quiet of what happened. It could be just like, Shh, we have a secret together. Don't you know how exciting it is to have a secret? It could be with bribing. In my case, sometimes uh, money was involved. It could be by threatening, saying, hey, if you, don't te if, you, if, you don't, if you don't be quiet, I'm going to tell your parents. In my case, it was very effective because my, par my parents were very severe if they punished and he said you did something wrong so if I tell your parents then you would be punished and that was a very effective way uh, to uh, to keep quiet so it took me 19 years after my 12 year because I was abused from 7 till 12 years old before I started to talk to someone else about this so those are the four steps um, like I said it was a very serious uh, topic I'll bring it back I'll probably write some blogs about it too because I think it was very insightful what uh, those people brought here the f by far more details that I can give uh, in in several situations either a domestic situation or if your child goes to like uh, uh, you know summer camp or youth organization 
Uh, there could be sports and it could be Boy Scout, Girl Scout, what have you not, right? It could unfortunately even be uh, a youth groups in church and, and so on and so on. All right, so this was Jean with the podcast Thrive, Not Survive After uh, Child Abuse uh, with episode 54. I hope to uh, see you and hear back tomorrow with another episode of this podcast. Okay, with that, I said bye-bye.